being yourself. So, um, so yeah. Um, I say uh, we can go ahead and start then. Okay. Come on. Okay. Um, cool. So, hello. Hey, Chella. Hey, Nadia. Good to see you. <laughs> Two days in a row on the computer. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, anyways, y'all, so we're, we'll get started then. Um, so basically, uh, welcome, welcome to uh, our Fight Against the War on Youth meeting. And um, well, we are a small crew today, and um, which actually I think will really, will really work because we have something more interactive planned. Um, but of course, I know everyone's comfort level is different with the camera, with voice, you know, sharing your voice. So, um, so if you don't feel like talking or showing your face, that's all good. Um, you're welcome to always put it in the chat. Uh, the chat is open and folks are able to unmute themselves, of course, um, because we have been Zoom bombed before. Um, we, you know, if, if people start getting like not cool, like, yeah, we'll just, we'll stop, you know, we'll, we'll kick them out. <laughs> so we won't let that happen. But because this is meant to be interactive, folks can unmute themselves um, and, um, uh, you know, and be able to type in the chat as well. So um, this is going to be a little different from the other webinars. And basically the, you know, the idea for today is, um, so for some, for a couple folks, it, um, you know, who've been in this fight with us, um, like Celine from Palestinian Youth Movement um, and Chella and other folks, um, you know, some of these programs that will sound familiar, you know about them. Uh, what we'll do is just kind of have a conversation about um, not only about the programs, but about what they mean, their impact. And, um, and also the hope is to see, um, you know, now that folks were a little more like separated and quarantined, it, uh, it would be really great to get, um, to get, you know, some online support with some things, uh, some things we're moving in our fight. And so um, towards the end, I'll share some areas that, that we are looking, uh, looking to build on with folks. And um, I know uh, we'll also be talking with um, a couple people from ENCODE Justice. I'm not sure if uh, they're here yet, but, um, but yes. So, um, I'm, am I missing anything, Hamid? Anything else, like logistically, or is, or does that everything sounds about right? Everything sounds pretty good, and we're being recorded, so it'll, oh, be, yeah. up, it'll be uploaded on the website by Thursday. We are being recorded, and uh, and yes, I'm happy to be joining you all outdoors. I was inside uh, teaching from my computer all day, so I said, all right, for this one, I'm going to be outdoors. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this will work, the introductions will work since we are a small group. Um, and so what would be great is if um, each of us could just share our name, our gender pronoun, and um, an example of how the state or government is at war with youth. Um, it can be maybe a fight you're involved in, you'd like to get involved in, or just something you know. Um, and it would be great if we do popcorn style. And then what we'll do, what I'll do then is, um, if, if you don't feel comfortable again, like I said, speaking, you can just um, put it in the chat as well. Um, so no worries there. Um, I'll go ahead and start. And you should be able to see um, the participants list. Um, so that would help then with calling on, on folks. So there are, yeah, there's 12 of us. So um, just, uh, yeah, we'll call on people. So uh, hello, I'm Nadia. Um, I go by she, her, hers, gender pronoun. And um, an example of, of, a, of a fight I'm involved in is, um, is this one currently the the fight against um, how young people, particularly black and brown youth and queer youth are being um, treated as a threats to national security. And so, um, so yeah, that's, that would be what I, that would be something I'm involved in and um, I'll popcorn it to Akil. Hi everyone, my name is Akil. Um, gender pronoun is he, him. And um, I'm also involved in this fight. I. Um, joined in 2017 and um, really appreciated all the time I spend with this organization. And um, I would invite anybody if it's their first time, it's a really wonderful crew of people. 
So anyway, um, I will throw it to uh, Sydney. Hi, I'm Ayush. Oh, oh God, I I go ahead, go ahead. Um, oh, my apologies. Uh, so I use she, her pronouns. I am a PhD student at University of Maryland, um, and I am studying the intersection of information science and criminal justice reform. Um, and something I'm researching now is how to dismantle gang databases and how it affects um, my former students, because um, I used to be a high school teacher in the South Bronx. Um, but yeah. Um, and I'm going to throw it to Celine. Um, hey, y'all, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, my name is Celine Fusini. I My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I um, organize with the Palestinian Youth Movement, and we've been in partnership with Stop LAPD Spying um, for a couple years now. Um, and one example of like what we've been involved in is combating the countering violent extremism uh, programs, again, as Nadia was saying, which um, categorize um, our communities as threats to national security. Um, these are surveillance programs that we've been fighting for a really long time and looking at the relationship between Zionism, surveillance, anti-Muslim racism, um, and this larger war on terror and connecting the war on drugs, the war on gangs, and the war on terror in our narrative of how we think about these programs. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll pass it to Mirad. Mirad, you're, you're muted. Uh, we can't hear you. Sorry for that. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Maral. Um, I'm, my pronouns is she, hers, um, and I'm the new legal fellow at Project South uh, in Atlanta. I'm, my research in law school has been all like around CV programs um, and especially how um, they intersect with youth um, from the mental health perspective. Um, that's primarily kind of my project. Um, at Project South, I'm focusing on um, a lot of different ways that the um, a lot of ways that youth are affected, um, particular in um, Middle Eastern and South Asian communities. So that's kind of my focus at Project South. I'm just excited to get to know you guys more um, and learn more about what Stop LAPD has been doing on this front. Um, and then I will send it to. Um, Kiani. Hi, um, my name's Kiani Brown and I go by she and her. Um, I'm a student at LPU and um, right now I'm focusing on advocating for police brutality. So I'm hoping like this program or organization will help me just get more information on that and like more background information. Um, a popcorn, Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I go by he, him pronouns. Um, my day job is I teach uh, radical philosophy, but I've been involved in um, queer anarchism and um, sort of like non-party, like Marxist groups for a long time. And uh, I don't know, I've just been like an abolitionist for a hell of a long time. And I know that the youth are a really important part of it. I guess since I teach in schools, the school, school's a really big issue. Um, they're meant to empower you, but in fact, there's so many rules and restrictions and ways that they mess with your mind that I think that's a, a big part of it. Um, all popcorn to uh, Chella. Have you, have you gone yet? Cool. Hey, can y'all hear me? Can folks hear me? We hear you, Cello. Yes. Okay, okay just making sure. Um, I am Cella. My pronouns are she and they. Um, and I am. I am involved in the fight through intersectionality and looking at uh youth looking at trans folks looking at disabled folks looking at migrant folks looking at deaf folks looking at 
um, all the possible intersectionalities that can hinder um, livelihood, right? Um, and I, um, yeah, there you go. Um, I will pass it on to Eugene. Um, I kind of came late into this. So uh, can you um, just quickly tell me what the prompt question is, uh, Hamid or whoever? I guess just name and pronoun. Is that it? All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I, I know everyone's giving this like broad answer and I'm not really sure what the specific question is. Uh, but my name is Eugene. Uh, my pronouns are he, they. Um, I'm a part of DSA and uh, the Los Angeles Tenants Union at the moment. So just uh, looking forward to learning more from these discussions. So I think it's just Pancake uh, and myself, Lex. So go ahead, Pancake. Hey. Um, how's everybody doing in Zoom land out there? Can you hear me okay? Um, yes, sir. We're in the, we're in the, oh, man, it's, the work continues, man. The struggle continues, you know. You know, what do we say to data-driven policing? Shut it down. Yeah, the war on our youth, you know, as a father and a grandfather. And I see Hamas' daughter, Nadia, as an educator. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm just here, man, in support. You know, stop LAPD spying. The work that has been done, the work that is yet before us to be done. Dismantle and abolish this system that's not working. And that's how I feel about it. So I turn it over to, I guess you, Hamid. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Hamid, and uh, happy to be here. Uh, I go by he, him, and uh, and I'm just going to be providing technical support. Uh, uh, you know about people coming in, and also keeping an eye in case if we get zoom bombed, which we have in the past a couple times. So if something happens, I'll let folks know right away. So. Passing it on to Nadia and Akil. Thank you. I think you're muted, Nadia. Thank you. Um, sorry, y'all. My uh, my Zoom on my laptop is acting up, so luckily I have it on my phone. Um, Hamid, would you, since I shared the presentation, would you actually mind just sharing your screen? Um, I'll keep trying to reconnect on my laptop, but it's uh, even today I had to Zoom with one of my class periods from my phone. It was little frustrating so thank you um so okay so basically um yes and like i said i will try to join again um through here so if, if it does let me and then i can go back to sharing my screen um so if you don't mind clicking present um oh there we go okay great Okay, so it looks like I am on my laptop. Perfect. Are folks uh, are folks able to hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, if if you wouldn't mind uh, enabling me to share my screen, please. I can't hear you. Sorry for that. Let me just, uh, there you go. Sorry, okay. Sorry for that. Yeah, go ahead. No, no worries. These are Zoom realities. So, all right. Um, cool. Thanks again, everybody. Appreciate folks' patience. Um, and if it does kick me out again, then I'll just leave you to go ahead and share it. Um, so, I, I apologize. I missed this introduction. Um, so hopefully, um, you know, I did hear um, a couple and like Sydney yourself and so I already you know part of this meeting what I would what um, what I was hoping to is to see, you know, how, how we can support each other in whatever work we're doing. And so um, 
So maybe towards the end, if, if folks see some of the areas they you know, that they, they vibe with, they connect with, they would like to work on, um, that would be great. So basically, um, what I wanted to start off with is um, some of you are familiar with our diagram, the stalker state, and um, which I'll be showing in a minute. But if um, if folks want to just either put in the chat or you could uh, do a raise hand or just unmute yourself. If um, if we get a bunch of people unmuting at the same time, we can put folks on stack. But um, if we just to get started, um, just wanting to know what people know about in terms of governmental bodies or private companies accessing your daily information and how do they access it? So it can be any any agency, any public entity, um, like who accesses our information and how do they access it? So if folks either want to unmute themselves and share or um, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. And we use the term stalker state because that's how we refer to the state. That's how we refer to the government um, as essentially as stalking us because um, they are constantly, particularly black and brown communities, any communities deemed other, queer, trans folks. Um, the government and state is always monitoring, tracking and criminalizing. And so, so for us, we're just, um, this is why we call it the stalker state. So anyone want to share or anyone want to put in the chat? Any examples? Okay. Yeah, there, there are examples in chat. Most of our free apps on our phones sell our information to data brokers who then sell our information to government and more specifically law enforcement. Yes, and that's, that's something, you know, there's always money to be made um, on black and brown bodies. Um, at protests, stingrays, and other cell towers, LAPD, Department of Homeland Security, fusion centers. Okay, and, and I'll uh, explain what fusion centers are. Anybody else? You're welcome, like I said, to unmute or put in the chat. Car repos yes, car repo companies collect license plate data and sell it to ICE with massive database aggregating billions of records. Yes, and also um, the, li uh, the license plate recognition, also working hand in hand with ICE and other, and other entities. Palantir, which is the, um, the predictive policing. Universities also have partnership with ICE to collect license plate information, yes. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that, um, about what that academic complicity looks like. So not only are universities partnering with agencies, but they're also providing, they're getting money to provide research to then support the programs and, and policies that criminalize our communities. Yes. Anything else? I hear unmute. Shakir, were you wanting to share? I saw you unmute. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, and I was gonna just look it right back. Um, like different ways of tracking association and like who knows who and who kind of hangs out with who. That's especially used for targeting of youth, and that can come really easily from like social media and um, like people, like police will use just like evidence of oh, this person is talking to this person. Um, to build investigations and label people as gangs just based on who their friends are and who they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the social network analysis. Yes, and that's actually um, part of this, um, part of what hopefully we'll get to today and, and a conversation when we've done a similar workshop with high school students. Um, this is something we talk a lot about is how do we balance um, being able to have the freedom to express and be who we are um, but knowing that we're being monitored and knowing that that based on who we are and different aspects of our identity that we're criminalized. Um, I see some more in the chat. Um, ICE collects address information from utility companies. Yes, and big tech companies keep your geodata, your cell company as well. Yes, I'm sure if anyone has an iPhone, you might have seen like they try to say register this as your home, this is your work, right? 
Okay, cool. Uh, and feel free. I'm going to move Maybe forward. One thing also, uh, if I could add to that. So I think many times we look at uh, the private sector and social media, but I think the state itself and the government itself is a major data broker. Uh, because when you look at how much information the state collects, it's way more than because it has so many different ways uh, from Social Security Administration to DMV to, I mean, just your baseline information, uh, then your, your, your birth information, uh, somebody's talking about Sally Mae and Fannie Mae and financial institutions about home loans and mortgages. And then now increasingly, like when we look at um, uh, outsourcing for, for cloud services and providing cloud services, and that's where a lot of money is being made by Microsoft and IBM and also now, for example, uh, Axon that makes uh, manuf uh, the old name was Taser, which changed their name to Axon, which manufactures body cameras is now talking about all the footage that they are getting, which is hours and hours and millions and millions of hours of footage, the background footage. They are experimenting with that to come up with this whole idea of predicting people's moves. So even they are going even to that level as well of, of investigation and all of that information is coming from the state for the cloud services that they are providing uh, for body camera footage. So, so just wanted to add that. Nadia, you may be frozen. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a stalker state chart. And what this is doing is that it's basically, it's capturing uh, a whole bunch of things where we, when we go from private sector to public sector and how information is exchanged and information moves through a lot of these different se sectors themselves. So for, for example, we've been able to map DMV um, and it is very telling that even when we talk about sanctuary cities and sanctuary states, that a lot of times people try to figure out like, well, how did ICE get this information? But I think what is happening is that many times this information is moving in so many different ways. And then when you add license plate readers and a lot of that information uh, that is being shared. So even if local law enforcement agencies have contracts or if they have signed memorandums of understandings, or being part of the sanctuary city, a lot of time this information is available through various other things. Um, Nadia, I don't know if you're back, but uh, I just went over and opened my own. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And if, if you don't mind actually just doing the screen sharing, just because I would hate to for it to keep being disrupted if, um, okay. just because my laptop is acting up and I, I got to figure out what's going on with it. Um, but I do have my phone just in case here. So. Um, uh, so, so then you were able to go through the stalker state? Not really. I just kind of talked about it very briefly. Okay. Yeah. And so, and then, so it looks like you talked about the public sector. And so the fusion centers, um, which somebody mentioned in the chat as well, basically what fusion centers are, uh, um, are basically 
these mega large spy centers where all the information that's collected on us, whether it's from private companies, whether, whether it's through the various public sectors, so schools, hospitals, public transportation, the cops, social services, and then the information gets funneled into there. And then from there, it gets shared out to thousands of agencies. And um, the largest, uh, one of the largest fusion centers is actually in Norwalk, um, here in basically in LA County. And, um, and so, and just to kind of pause also, because this can be very overwhelming for folks sometimes to look at, but um, we like to see the way we've been able to chip away at the stalker state. Um, for example, the fusion center, uh, a few years back, we, uh, a group of youth shut it down for the day um, twice. We forced them to be on lockdown because essentially they were exposing the existence of this fusion center. Um, another, another piece we can somewhat chip away at is um, you see the drones, right? The drones is on the circle between um, fusion and private. Um, and it really was people power that forced LAPD to ground their drones for many years as well. Um, laser, right? Oops, if you can go back actually. Thank you. Uh, laser, um, which uh, was a program that LAPD was using, um, the Los Angeles Strategic Extraction and Restoration Program, that was also defeated from people power. Um, and, then, and then of course, predictive policing in LA, um, we as different communities were able to dismantle here also. And so, um, and so this is something for to remind as overwhelming and as many things as are on here, um, that's really part of our journey to abolition is how are we at least slowly chipping away at it, right? Not reforming it, but removing it and chipping away. And so, um, and so those programs that I mentioned, PredPol and LASER are in the LAPD architecture of surveillance, which is its own diagram. So maybe Hamid, you can put the link to that as well in the chat, the, the architecture of surveillance and the stalker state. And that, that essentially focuses on the way the LAPD is uh, tracing and tracking. Um, and then, uh, and then, of course, um, the private sector, which folks have been mentioning, and so the private sector has always been right in, under a capitalist system. Um, it inherently will uh, will criminalize and see us as dispensable. And so, so this this diagram we could spend a long time on, but just wanted to at least share it with folks. And um, and then um, yeah, and hopefully the link if you can put that in the chat. And then we'll uh, then give you some more time to uh, to look at it as well. Um, does anyone have any questions about it before we move forward? Um, I had a quick question. How like does anyone know how the Fourth Amendment right to like like you have to request a search and seizure before you go looking for people's information? Like how is the government like circumventing that? Like I know they do a ton of illegal sh every day, but like like what is their official justification? Sorry, it's lagging for me. Shakir, I don't know if you want to, because I have, I have some thoughts about it. But... Yeah, I can speak quickly, and then I actually, I have to jump off right after this, but I can, I can say that, which, you know, yeah, like the Fourth Amendment does exist that provides this, like the uh, limitation on, police searches basically need to be searches and seizures need to be reasonable but those categories are extremely malleable both in the form of both at the point of like what is actually required to trigger a search and then what actually counts as a search so most of what we're talking about here police just just say you know they, they can easily say it's not really a search to be collecting information that exists in public or that they're observing in public or even the the, the triggers for it are as simple as, you know, you just need some really minimal baseline suspicion, or even worse, sometimes, obviously, a lot of these systems don't actually even have those triggers. It's just based on kind of predictions about what people are going to do, or kind of wholesale suspicion of communities, and just the, you know, pre preventing or predicting crime. And so even though those, even though like those kind of rules exist legally, they they're not, you know, they're not really meant to they were never really designed to protect against the government broadly, um, you know, being just the instrument of suspicion and targeting people and and maintaining this domination. And in practice, they don't they don't really they don't really do that either. 
And I think if I can just quickly add to that, the overall fight is uh, for the coalition is not to uh, really kind of just go after and, and plead for the use of uh, Fourth Amendment because we know that that by itself is a blueprint for oppression. That's what the Constitution has been doing for the last 260 odd years. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, so the whole idea of warrantless surveillance and all of that for us, it's really like this very reformist kind of uh, uh, weak stuff. Uh, so the goal is really about dismantlement. But even with that, that how these things get flaunted as well. For example, this program, Suspicious Activity Reporting Program, this was one of the first programs after the Intelligence uh, Reform Terrorism Prevention Act in 2004 after 9-11. And in that, uh, they even defined suspicious activity as observed behavior reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning. So when you really break it down, there is no standard. So some of the cops are observing your behavior, which reasonably in, is reasonably indicative, meaning so there is no probable cause, no reasonable suspicion. So it's just speculative, hunch-based, and reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning that somebody's thinking of doing something wrong. So they, they use this uh, 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 thing about behavioral surveillance, that behavior will let us now lead us to prevent crime, which is so subjective and completely bogus, absolutely. And that was the whole idea behind gang databases as well. Um, if I could just add, um, also um, Project South is gonna come out with a report very soon about um, that analyzes the way uh, the, legal, the legal rules behind how the government is kind of they're legally allowed to access our data. And one of those is because the Fourth Amendment has historically been associated with um, property, like definitions of property. It never really protected um, people, it only protected property through the concept of trespass. Um, and recently it protects more through the reasonable expectation of privacy idea. But the problem is um, the Supreme Court construes this as having, um, if you share your data with someone else, such as a utility company or, you know, your phone, um, you know, your phone company has access to your phone records. Um, if you're just on the street um, and, you know, your license plate gets read by someone, that's all just given to someone else. So this is called third party doctrine. And because you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy for other people collecting your data, um, then it can just be used freely across the government and shared as long as you give it to a third party. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, um, and yeah, I apologize. I wasn't able to to weigh in on the question, my uh, my laptop did finally just give out, so I'm switching permanently to the phone <laughs> for today. And um, so, um, yeah, any any other questions or any comments from folks before we move forward? Okay, cool. If you can go to the next slide, please. Oh, excuse me, I didn't realize I was still on mute. Um, if you could go uh, share the screen again, please. Thank you. Um, so um, if you don't mind making it bigger too. Um, so basically, um, so within the stalker state, right? Um, and this is something we're actually in the process of developing. And um, it's essentially also, it's a kind of a call out to folks who, um, who would like to support with this. We're in the process of making a youth stalker state, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But, um, but essentially, um, and Hamid talked about SAR, it's a special activity reporting program. But one thing we talk about is how this is not a moment in time, but a continuation of history. And um, next, please. And so, um, and so what we see is, is right, we know the last few decades, we've seen young people, uh, particularly black and brown um, youth being targeted as uh, gang members. And now what we're seeing is that narrative, of course, continues today. 
and now it's being taken to a national security level, right? So young people being seen as potential violent extremists or terrorists, right? And so, um, and so basically we see this narrative coming together very explicitly, um, which has been happening now for some time, but, um, but this is the shift where we've been seeing now for, for at least uh, over 10 years. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and so Hamid talked about SAR, so I won't go too much into it again, but essentially um, SAR was one of the programs that didn't necessarily begin because behavioral surveillance has been happening. Um, and, so, and so basically what SAR did was it legitimized it furthermore, right, in the 2000s. So in 2008, and then LAPD has had various versions of, of the suspicious activity reporting program. And so, and really what it says is the, is the reasonably indicative of pre-operational planning, which essentially says that, that just the fact that you could be thinking about committing a crime and you doing whatever behavior, whether it's uh, taking a photograph in public, asking a business their hours of operation, these are considered pre-operational planning. These are considered actions that mean you could be thinking of committing a criminal activity. Uh, next, please. And so, um, so one of the programs that this, um, that suspicious, that's the SAR program really helped lay the groundwork for is the Countering Violent Extremism Program. And this is created by, this was created by the Department of Homeland Security. And essentially what it says is it says that people are on a pathway, are on a freeway to radicalization. Now for those of us on this meeting, right, um, I imagine most, if not all of us uh, take pride in hopefully being radicalized or in that process, right? And so, um, so for us, this is definitely not something we see as negative, but of course the state does. And so, so what they essentially say is, and, and they've treated communities as being inherently prone to becoming violent extremists or quote unquote terrorists, right? And so things such as being opposed to US foreign policy, being too much into your culture, uh, going frequently to the mosque, these are behaviors that could be seen as you might become a violent extremist or a terrorist. And what makes this program particularly uh, even more dangerous is, it's, um, is that basically it's, um, sorry, excuse me, I'm just getting a message. Um, what makes this program particularly dangerous is it's promoted as something that's not law enforcement based, but it's by the DHS, it's by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but it provides grants um, to even nonprofits, community organizations, and says you all as these community orgs go and treat your community and then come back and report to us, DHS. And so it's, cre it's further creating then snitches um, within our communities. Um, and LA is one of the three cities that has adopted the framework uh, and they adopted it in 2011. And um, Celine, if, if you wanna talk a little more about that, um, that would be great. Yeah, that, that's the insidious part of the CD programs is that they're disguised as community alternatives to um, criminalization initiatives or law enforcement initiatives. But be, again, like the way they operate is that they partner with institutions that already have relationships with community, as Nadia was saying, including nonprofits, universities, schools, whatever, mosques. Um, basically institutions where community members already congregate or receive services from. And they basically leverage those relationships to attain information. So um, that's one of the major consequences of these programs is that it um, uh, sows a lot of distrust within community members and between and among community members and institutions because you're not sure who it is that might be um, reporting or, or which institutions you can trust. Um, and just to say that when, it, when we say that LA adopted the framework, it doesn't even mean that they need a grant from the Department of Homeland Security. It's just the fact of LA um, utilizing this pre-crime model or this preventative model to institute this type of policing and surveillance. So all, it's just about the framework, regardless of whether or not the Department of Homeland Security directly administers funding to Los Angeles. So for example, in 20, I think it was 2018, a bunch of us, a bunch of our organizations we're organizing against LA, uh, the mayor attempting to receive a $400,000 grant from the Department of Homeland Security and he ended up rejecting it um, because of the immense amount of pressure we put on city council. 
Um, but it doesn't mean that there is, is no longer CBE in LA. It's still happening through different ways um, because the framework, it's the framework of surveillance and policing that um, LA has adopted as a, like a community strategy of policing. Um, and also just to say that like when we talk about these programs, you really, um, um, with the coalition, we, we really believe in contextualizing them and historicizing them to say that these programs are really explicitly anti-Muslim in terms of countering violent extremism, but they also um, really heavily target Black Muslim communities and follow in this legacy um, harmed Black communities um, since, especially like the targeting of the Ahmadiyya communities in the 30s by the FBI, we see how this model of pre-crime or surveilling entire communities comes also out of broken windows policing, um, which was, um, uh, broken windows theory was basically has been used by law enforcement to specifically criminalize black communities since the 80s and 90s and it theorizes that everyday norms and like local cultural social norms play a role in the development of criminal activity um, so basically they're looking at an entire community saying that this the culture the the social norms of this community could play a role in originating crime so we need to surveil and police this entire community on the day-to-day -day and police their everyday lives on the day to day. So the, the this and radicalization theory is modeled after that, which um, posits that increased like religiosity or politicization of Muslims leads to an increased threat of terrorism. So there's this whole legacy. Um, it, it, these are fundamentally anti black programs, anti Muslim uh, programs that are uh, being pushed within our communities under the guise of, of community initiatives when really they're just um, like soft surveillance, soft policing models and ways to get uh, information about uh, our communities and basically neutralize political organizing as well. Great, right. thank you for adding that, Celine. Um, and, um, and then within this violent extremism framework um, is the BIE, Black Identity Extremism, um, which has technically been dropped by the FBI, but, um, but really, um, we know that the actual criminalization, because BIE essentially um, was building on a long legacy we know of criminalizing the black community and particularly uh, claiming that black youth who are organizing against police brutality, it's because of, of uh, violence they're perceiving. So the FBI said that they're, because you, black youth are perceiving the violence, this could then turn, turn them into potential violent extremists or terrorists. And the reason and, and what the reason we're watching this um, closely is, is because one of the things within um, the Department of Homeland Security came out um, in, with a report that basically said one of the pieces of countering violent extremism is to change its name. So as and, and this is exactly this is what the DHS said was that as people might organize and come to know and become against it, we, meaning the DHS, need to shift and change the names. So even though, for example, BIE was dropped uh, as, as a designation, it, it, in, in practice, it was not dropped. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, okay, and so one thing, if, um, if we could put, uh, if folks can maybe put on the chat, um, or you're welcome to unmute yourself, um, this is a question. So these are examples. I'm going to be talking about the PVE, the Preventing Violent Extremism Program. So um, if you look here, so these are some examples of how young people are policed and criminalized, right? Through clothing, being called defiant, right? Gender and sexuality expression, cultural expression, student organizers. So um, if folks either want to unmute or put in the chat, what are some specific examples of these that uh, maybe e either you've experienced or if you don't want to share that, somebody you know, or just something you've heard? Um, feel free to unmute yourself or uh, put that in the chat. And it can be any of those bullet points. I know if any, maybe if any teachers in the house, right, maybe specifically, especially that second one, right, the defiant one, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that, or any of them. I, I was just, hi, everybody, I was just studying um, the um, issue of, of um, 
compliance as a reason to suspend. And it, it, it is one of the most um, important distinctive reasons why black and brown and especially black children are suspended. And so officially um, uh, within Los Angeles and California, you know, they have made the shift in, rec in recognition um, to our pushback against the criminalization of our young people uh, that they will no longer allow uh, suspensions under that designation. But it, it is it's really truly unbelievable um, that that flew under the radar for so long. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is, you know, I'm just thinking of, of like, then obviously who is labeled as defiant or and then who gets labeled oh, you're standing up for yourself, right? Um, and so then that that differentiation. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Um, and then I see in the chat as well. Um, so, okay, I've had students being labeled a gang associate with no actual association with gangs. I've also noticed that my SPED, so special education students, are more likely to be labeled as criminal or defiant. Um, yes, that's something, um, even I remember myself in high school, um, having friends and of course they would make jokes out of it. Oh, I love being in sped. You know, they just threw me in there for no reason. And it's so easy, which of course, you know, when you're that age, you're, you're joking about it. You're like, okay, cool. But really like then looking back, um, you know, it's, it really was just, um, like really not only racist, but just ageist as well. And, and so, um, so yeah, I can, I can definitely relate to that, uh, Sydney. Definitely have, and, then, and more in the chat, definitely have seen a pattern of children in special ed students labeled as defiant, especially if they have behavioral disorders, children in special ed classes. Um, yes. Teens who skip class. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, has anybody, is, is, if anybody, if anyone's teaching online, have any of y'all heard from any like colleagues or other teachers um, just people already basically criminalizing youth who aren't able to make it to the online classes or assuming they must be just playing around or ditching or whatever. I don't know if anyone's heard that yet from any anybody else. Um, let me see if there's anything more in the chat. Well, Okay, well, well, thanks for thanks for sharing that, y'all. I know, um, I know definitely, and um, I think that's definitely a, a longer conversation too in terms of who gets labeled as um, as gang as, as gang affiliated, gang associated, right? It has a lot to do with the gang databases and injunctions, which um, you know, shout out to Youth Justice Coalition and folks who've been really um, pushing pushing a fight against that. Um, and and yeah, the special the the special education designation um, is it's really it's it can be used in very racist ways. I've definitely seen that. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please, and feel free y'all to keep putting in the chat if anyone else has anything to add. Um, can you go to the next slide? I'm trying. Let me. See. <laughs> oh, I didn't know. Maybe like I'm like, am I lagging? Yeah, I no. It just uh, I don't know why. It Kind of hold on, just give me one second. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, yeah, I don't know why everything is just freezing. Um, let me just open this again and present. Uh, and then, oops. What the heck is going on? I know between my laptop not wanting Zoom to work. Yeah, I don't know why it just it just froze. So my this is not cool. A killer people to share to screen share and share the presentation. Okay, let me pull it up on my end. Oh no, it looks like I'm gonna get it. Oh, it's working now. Okay, cool. Yeah, just... I am sorry, Nadia. I can't. Uh, that that whole screen thing is not gonna work. Sorry for that. 
Uh, okay. So I'll just go to this one. And go to the next one here. Well, we did oh, that. Okay. Uh, Hopefully, folks are able to still read it. Oh, you're not able to do the present. Is that what you're saying? Oh, wait. Uh, I think you have to click present. It's next to share up on the top right. Oh, okay. Yes. Nice. Thank you. Um, and so, so part of the reason uh, of asking that question and, um, and it was interesting when we asked this question with uh, high school students, we of course get like a wide range of answers, right? And, um, and so because we know young people are under particular surveillance, I mean, from in school in, in a whole other way as well. And so this, um, this other program um, is called Preventing Violent Extremism. And this was um, basically a set of guidelines that the FBI came up with in uh, January of 2016. And um, essentially what the FBI says is these behaviors, these aspects of young people's identities um, make, could make them suspicious and again, prone to becoming violent extremists. So things such as questioning authority, not doing well in school, um, expressing anger or frustration, um, living in poverty, being too much into your culture, being a migrant, feeling isolated. So really things that are core to, to young people's identities and particularly to youth of color. And so, um, and so basically what, uh, what these programs, uh, CVE, the one we just talked about and PVE are modeled after um, a program in England called Prevent. And Prevent basically has very similar guidelines and uh, we've actually been working with folks who are organizing, who have been organizing against Prevent, their teachers and students and families. Uh, and so in England, people are, uh, anybody who works with youth is already considered a mandated reporter. So for those of us who know what that means, uh, if you don't know what that means, um, here in the US, if you work with youth, you're a mandated reporter for abuse and neglect, which already is problematic because that gets, um, that gets used um, in very racist ways as well. And so, so just imagine now adding this level to it. And so, um, so this is why when we got wind of this, uh, we jumped on it right away because we saw what was happening in England as well. And so this is why then um, understanding that. And so right now they have not made any mandated reporting uh, here in the US, but, um, but that's something that we know is where it's headed. Um, next slide, please. Um, and, so, uh, and so basically then, this um, the gang member and violent extremism label, which of course it does go back to the 80s, this narrative of, of particularly against um, Central American youth uh, being labeled as uh, quote unquote street terrorists, gang members. Um, but really it's the last, um, you know, close to 20 years that we see um, the violent extremism and terrorism label being more explicitly connected to it. Um, so there's different military documents that have been exposed and surfaced um, showing these connections, um, even soldiers, uh, sorry, even programs uh, here in LA, in South Central, uh, of actually driving soldiers around and training them, saying this is the war on terror here, getting them ready to go and fight the war on terror abroad, right? And the name, which if, if folks have been familiar, is Jeff Brantingham, which um, is a who's a professor at UCLA, which in the uh, the fight against data-driven policing. He, him and various other um, faculty have been exposed and there's now there's been big movements now within the academic front um, in UCLA and universities across the country um, to really go after professors um, and and other people who are pushing research that then supports uh, these narratives and um, and and I'll actually take a moment to just pause here and to basically share um, also within the war on youth fight um, this is an, I don't know if Celine, if you're still there, you're welcome to add to this as well. We, um, we basically have uh, developed a coalition of folks, uh, students and communities against policing and surveillance. And, um, and essentially this has really been to take on the colleges and universities who are participating in these programs by being, getting grants to then provide research and also by surveilling and criminalizing the very students that go there. So there's two aspects to it. And so, um, so we've been essentially going after and, and identifying specific professors, specific programs um, who are 
are contributing to this uh, criminalization of our communities through this narrative. Um, and I don't know, Celine, if you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, um, I'll link the resource in the chat in a sec. We basically, um, we created this anti-CVE campus um, organizing toolkit for students. And um, over the past couple years, I think it's been a while, we, we started to host student convenings because students were attending our meetings, college students were attending our, our monthly meetings and talking about how either they were approached by someone at the university to take a CVE grant or how they were hearing about this program and wanted to know more. So we hosted student convenings to convene um, educators, students and community orgs, um, including uh, Pasadena Youth Movement, Stop LAPD Spying and a couple others to talk about, uh, to research together what universities are taking grants um, and to develop collective strategies. So we're probably gonna have another uh, like we're probably gonna have a strategy session in the next couple of weeks. Um, so if people want to share their emails, if anyone is interested, like if you want to drop your email in the chat, we can add you to that list. The other thing, uh, the other campaign we're really organizing around is getting CVE out of schools, out of the K through 12. Um, Stop LAPD Spying has really been looking at preventing violent extremism in schools um, since the FBI put out the report, I think around 2016. And we've been involved in the fights against CVE since around 2014, if not earlier. So, um, so uh, yeah, we just, we're, we've been organizing, um, developing a strategy to, to take on the CV programs as they're being implemented in the K through 12. Um, so again, if folks are interested in that, um, especially like students, educators, um, again, drop your email in the chat and we can uh, add you to that. Um, uh, but I think also we're looking at how these recent there's a there's been a recent round of grants that was released from the the Department of Homeland Security and it's been rebranded so now it's called the Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention Program or TVTP it's CVE it's the same um, but the they released um, a 2020 round of grants and um, there are a handful in California they've uh, they include the subgrantees all over the U.S. include hospitals. They include um, universities. They include um, a lot of universities. I'm looking at the list right now: police departments, counties, the National Governors Association. It's a wide, and even tribal governments actually have re have um, received grants. So there's a wide range of subgrantees. And again, as Nadia was saying, like the 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 implications of this is that um, these grants would authorize or deputize like any service providers or teachers or community leaders to identify and report on individuals that are perceived to be prone to extremism based off of the indicators that the DHS provides um, and which are very racist indicators and um, obviously they're looking at our communities as national security threats so it also these grants like you know partnering with hospitals and counties, it allows law enforcement to gain access to a space that otherwise would not have been available to them uh, by offering these grants. Um, so, and, and again, like, you know, how they're equating certain types of difference, whether it be religious or political or behavioral difference with the potential for quote unquote terrorism and, and asking these institutions to partner with them in finding out who these terrorists might be. So um, yeah, I just wanted to also give a quick update on the TBTP grants and share that locally we're gonna, uh, we were really interested in, in building out this strategy um, around the K through 12. So yeah, CVE out of academia, CVE out of schools. Uh, again, drop your emails if you're interested. Thanks. Nice, I saw a couple of folks did something. I saved the emails um, too, so. So yeah, that's um that's definitely a thanks thanks for breaking that down, Celine. And um, you know, that's one thing like really as a coalition we're we're taking on and and knowing that that the of the function of academia and of course I'm saying that as as myself, I'm a teacher as well, but I think that's you know, that's a lot of folks' motivation sometimes for going into this, right? Is is um is is knowing that. Um and so, so this last one, which um, Akil, if maybe uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the threat and risk assessment piece, um, is the LAPD PATH program, and um, we are we currently have uh, filed some Public Records Act requests 
um, to find out some more about them. And, um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about the PRA process as well. Um, but essentially, this path, which is providing alternatives to hinder extremism, is the LAPD's specific version of basically CVE and, P and PVE. And, um, and it brings together the units, the mental health unit, the gang unit, and then START, which is the school threat assessment and response team. Um, so Akil, if you would like to maybe uh, talk about that, please. Sure, yeah. So um, one thing to know about PATH is that this is um, a manifestation of a trend that we've seen for a long time, which is, you know, previously people kind of think about the feds as the ones doing the spying. You have the Department of Homeland Security, you have the FBI, you have um, CIA, which is, you know, inter international. And then you think um, there, it's almost like um, people who, before the, the uh, analysis of abolition became more widespread, that they were the bad ones and the local police are just, you know, doing, you know, I don't even know what people think. But the point is that LAPD path is actually a boutique version of what we're seeing on a national level that is in-house for the LAPD. And it started off with um, a program they have called Renew, which I'm trying to remember what it stands for, something about extremism, early warnings. If somebody remembers, you could put it in the chat, um, LAPD Renew. And yeah, it brings together, um, the met as, as Nadia was talking about, mental health unit, gang unit, and start. And the main um, instigator, or I shouldn't say the instigator, but the rationalization that they use is that it's responding to this outbreak of school shootings. Of course, the, the school <laughs> shootings are um, mostly white people, and we know who the LAPD targets, and it's not mostly white people. So in the name of preventing one kind of violence, they're actually inflicting a huge amount of violence. And um, another thing to, to know about the LAPD PATH program is that in, um, and the school threat assessment and response team is that um, when UCLA was researching how to implement uh, viol uh, countering violent extremism through a public health narrative, they actually recommended using START because they said it's an infrastructure that already exists for that purpose and that you could expand on it by incorporating more directly violent extremism. So we know that this is a trajectory that the city has, all, has wanted. So um, threat assessment and risk assessment, I wanted to talk really quickly about what that is because I think we're all still getting to know it and understand what that means. And one thing that I've taken from it is that it's, it's really a story, it's a narrative, like you know all types of racism. And one of the things that, that risk assessment or threat assessment does is it starts with an event and then they say, okay, this is, they, they, they call that event terrorism. And then they look back into that person's life before that. And they select events before that, that they think are relevant to form a narrative about why they did the behavior they did. And then they say, okay, if we monitor for these behaviors ahead of time, this will be um, an indicator or a risk factor. Those are the two types of language that they use that this behavior is gonna follow. Basically um, in this, this sense that um, behavior can be mechanized and predicted, which is something very similar to the data-driven policing um, uh, fight. And um, so risk assessment is actually interconnected with the radicalization theory, which also um, based on this war and terror narrative says that people are on a pathway to radicalization and these behaviors beforehand are, are indicators or risk factors of that. So it's a story that explains why explains behavior according to this racist conception of people who are who are actually predisposed to be violent. Um, so so th that's a little bit about the LAPD PATH program. And as Nadia said, yeah, we're trying to find out more about it and where it's headed. And um, I think that uh, another thing that uh, we are looking into more deeply is the way that the the TVTP grants, the new round of grants from um, the Department of Homeland Security, it's so much about threat assessment. Every other grant is about threat assessment. It's like a narrative that they're really 
heading towards on a national level as well. And in LA, one of the grants went to, um, went to a, 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 a local organization called Simon Weisenthal Center, which has already been operating in LAPD, I'm sorry, in LAUSD um, to do anti-bias trainings. Um, but we know that this is a, 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 a ruse to advocate for a very specific and biased um, form of, I mean, even a narrative about what constitutes bias, as well as creating um, an opportunity for snitches and for monitoring students and conducting threat assessments. The other last thing about this that I wanna say is that um, there was a, a bill passed by, um, by Congress um, that was also in response to school shootings that was basically um, providing money for school districts to create threat assessment centers. And um, it's a narrative that basically, you know, this is accelerating. So if, uh, if people have any questions about that, and also one of the things that I wanna put out there, because we were gonna have a conversation with some people from uh, ENCODE Justice today, and unfortunately their internet went down and they weren't able to make it. So I'd love to um, put it out into the chat um, of, uh, of a few, oh yes, thank you, Andrew. Complicity of psychologists from the most practical counselors to academic researchers is enormous. Absolutely. So this is, um, and Andrew, do you wanna unmute and talk a little bit about that? I'm, I'm not sure how much of an expert I am here, but behaviorism is uh, an approach to seeing the world that psychologists use. And it's all about guilt by association. They're actually not really fundamentally interested in motivations or history or people. And so that means that um, counselors and therapists are just looking at checklists and especially like people were saying, if they're mandatory reporters or they're people who work in institutions, they're gonna be collecting information that are gonna be used against people. And then the researchers as psychologists from anywhere from um, universities working on grants, they're the ones who are coming up with these frameworks on how to police people and what might be considered to be um, certain types of behavior. And at least myself as having studied the history of behaviorism, I think that it's, it's, it's um, something in general that we should be fighting against in addition to the people who are actually employing it. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's a scientific craze that one day may be seen as, as um, obviously racist and outdated as eugenics. Although eugenics is still obviously a very fundamental um, structure of how our society is built, you know. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And and one example of what Andrew's talking about, there's this um, researcher, I'm gonna put their name in the chat. Um, you can look up their, their stuff that is awful. Um, I think that they're at Brandeis, um, Jit Clausen, and they created, they compiled a database of what they consider to be terrorist, um, terrorist um, like uh, events. And then they were working with um, researchers at, in Colorado to actually create an algorithm to predict um, the likelihood that somebody was gonna be a, a terrorist based on behaviors extrapolated from the, the people from Jit Clausen's database going back in their life. So that's an example of that. Um, also, Celine had posted, um, Simon Weisenthal Center is one of our main local targets in our organizing um, strategy. Absolutely, they are a far right-wing Zionist organization um, that is very involved in policing that. Oh, so Andrew's saying, not only have criminology, psychology, have always had a very cozy relationship, but behaviorism came out of military research in World War II. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, deep scientific complicity and psycho psychology complicity. Um, Nadia's back. Do you want to take a little bit? Do you want to go from there? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so we can actually, I think this part we can skip, um, but basically this was um, looking at social media and uh, this, this conversation particularly goes really all also, I mean, we all use social media, but um, really it was looking at kind of finding um, the balance, right, between um, being able to essentially be able to be who you are 
and because it's you know especially right now um you know with with people not being able to be in person and so then how are we balancing being us but also knowing that um particularly young people are then being um, criminalized and targeted um if you can go to the next slide maybe that those are some questions um to see if what folks think about um sorry actually the next one please um if you can go to the next one. Um, so basically, uh, we have one more. There you go. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to actually talk about, and we can always go back to the conversation about social media, um, but basically, this was what you see here. Um, this was when we did the workshop with high school students. Um, it was a similar one to this one, but it, it was different, and it was obviously in person, and it was a lot more interactive and everything. But, um, but we created um, this diagram. Well, it's a diagram in progress. And um, it's basically called uh, the Youth Stalker State. And um, one, of the, one of the youth organizers with the coalition, um, she actually gave it this name, uh, the Yes, Let's Fight Back, which she, uh, she said is the Y'all Ain't Slick Stalker State. That's what it stands for. And um, originally, it started off as a high school stalker state to see how are, how are young people being um, criminalized in schools but then knowing that it really and so this is um what we what what we did was uh was different people in small groups um so like it was it was about um 40 or so youth and they were in different groups and they created um these basically maps so after looking at the stalker state diagram that we put um, they said, okay, how are then, how is this happening in high schools? How is this happening in your school? And so this is one which, um, which if you're able to zoom in, you can see, right, that in this one, they talked about education, they talked about places. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, this one, this particular one focused on different components of schools. So, right, parents, teachers, and of course, this is looking at LAUSD. And so, um, and then looking at students, um, you know, and looking also at uh, counselors as well. And then if we go to the next one, um, again, this is another one diagram and uh, there's a couple more, so you can kind of go through them and go to the next one, please. And, um, and, so, and so basically those ones, those photos were essentially, and um, for, those, for those who are on this meeting right now to think about, about who would want to maybe um, collaborate on this, we're trying to turn that into a diagram, right? And so we're trying to, and this was not only from that workshop, but then tonight, but he wasn't able to, um, they then, a smaller group, then turned it into um, sort of a more, um, a tighter version of it. And so we're in the process of creating this youth stalker state. So um, if anyone's interested in helping create that and, and helping put it together, uh, that would be great. And um, this is something actually before uh, before we go into the fight back, um, this is something I wanted to put out to folks as well. Um, this was the question. So how do we find that balance of being able, and this is more just a question for thought, right? Whether it's for yourself or if you have kids or if you're a teacher for your students um, or, even, or even if you're not a teacher or a parent, just anybody you can think of in your life or even yourself um, how can we find the balance of being able to, um, to be expressive, right? To be able to be you while also knowing that surveillance and criminalization um, by the stalker state is real. So I um, wanted to throw that question out there and um, see if anybody would like to put in the chat or um, unmute yourself and, um, and share. And there really isn't one right answer, right? This is more just um, something that um, I know like my students talk about sometimes. And so I don't know if folks have ever have heard or have discussed this. So something that I've done recently is I've started, so like students I still keep in contact with in a mentoring role. Um, I've started like sharing research with them that like gives them 
more information on how they're being surveilled um, so that they have all the information in the agency to make that decision for themselves. I don't think, especially as like a white educator, it's my role to tell them what that looks like. Um, but for me, it's mostly about making that information available and making recommendations on like things they can read to get better information that they may have had access to previously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear you on that in terms of being able to, um, you know, in terms of making the information available. I mean, I think it's, it's just, it's, you know, knowing who we are, especially being teachers in a classroom and especially um, for, for white educators teaching te uh, students of color, I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, yeah, anybody else, any, any other thoughts about this? Andrew has some comments in the chat. So yeah, I was suggesting, oh, I, I was suggesting that maybe um, instead of trying to tell students to like look out and stop posting, which they might see as scolding or as just like the olds trying to tell them not to do their fun things, to uh, try and teach more empowering tech techniques like the ones that many different uh, groups and do workshops with like the EFF or people more focused on uh, uh, criminalized neighborhoods. And so that means like using different profiles, using encrypted uh, messaging tools, things like that. Something else that's come up is um, I've had to tell students like if this is like a very attractive looking female and she's not with her friends, this is a technique that law enforcement officers have been known to use to collect information from our youth. And so just giving them evidence like, no, I'm not telling you that you're ugly or that this girl couldn't possibly be interested in you. This is a well documented technique of law enforcement and just like be careful. Anybody else, or even in, in your own sort of practices with social media, anybody else have thoughts about this? Yeah, um, I wanted to emphasize, I think it was Andrew who mentioned this before, but finding the ways to circle back to like where you can find your own sense of empowerment, our own sense of control and agency over how you're expressing yourself and where and when. So um, in my work with youth, I found it really inspiring to hear the different ways in which they have come to understand different platforms that they're using and um, building on that have like created specific like social media practices that they engage with on each platform um, based on how like psychologically safe they feel on different ones or what sorts of networks they're able to cultivate on each platform. And I think having that sort of plan um, and knowing how you're going to use it to best support yourself is important. Well, for me, I um, and I don't know how successful it is. I, I have a 15 year old daughter and, um, you know, I talk about just my own concern that that in, in terms of myself. Right. So I don't want to experience the world mediated through me filming it for other people. I want to just look at things. So, you know, I just talk about like um, how it's more enjoyable to me to share things after the fact than to be in the moment um, with with social media, um, and I and I just try to emphasize what that means to me rather than kind of you know placing that as a demand on her. But it is something that I noticed in my own life, like you know that that there is a difference between experiencing something fully. <laughs> And, um, and experience it and while you're curating it for the world that you imagine.
Yeah, it looks like um, Andrew might have been building on that, Angela, saying they have a lot to teach us in that as youth are often attracted to platforms that erase data, allowing them to change identities, et cetera, which often align with best practices for organizers. I don't know how to use TikTok. <laughs> I keep, I know that I, I keep getting told I'll do a TikTok. <laughs> like one of these days I'll, I'll get on that. <laughs> Anybody else who, who hasn't shared who'd like to share? I know, um, I know one of the things I was, um, when somebody was, uh, had mentioned about using um, different like uh, technologies or signal, um, I know for us, like when we've done digital security trainings, we do, we do talk about those. Um, but also I think we, we come also from the, from the perspective of, of knowing that, okay, nothing is really a hundred percent. And so by, by being able to almost assume that, okay, we are being monitored. So then kind of flipping the script and finding power in that um you know I know like sometimes I'll even jokingly like talk shit to Siri because I'm like I know the state's probably listening what I'm saying to Siri you know what I mean and so you almost like can flip it that way and uh, that can also I guess be used as sort of a, a a tactic back on the state as well um yeah um Cool. So I don't know if any if, if folks have uh, don't have any more around that. Um, what I wanted to do um, just to kind of close um, this basically was um, to just share some ways that we've been fighting back, and also um, wanted to see you know if, if anybody I know a couple of folks already dropped their emails around some of the academic complicity. Sorry, the metro is going by. <laughs> Yeah, it was the, the mosquitoes started coming out in the park. So I was like, let me go to my car. <laughs> so um, these are just basically some ways we've been fighting back, right? Filing Public Records Act requests um, that are community driven, right? So working with um, student orgs or students, um, UTLA as well, uh, passing strong motions against, um, you know, countering violent extremism and PVE, doing different art workshops, skill sharing workshops, um, creating outreach materials and comics and videos as well. And, um, and then just basic organizing, which of course organizing has now taken a new shape right online. Um, but if you can actually go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is some of the areas that we um, you know, are currently working on specifically now that you know, we're not doing things in person, and so one of the things that we're, um, that we're doing and would love for um, to build with and get support on as well is um, some research and just going through different articles. Because as we mentioned, CVE and PVE, the program targeting youth K through 12 um, are being developed, right? So they're definitely not static. They are being pushed forward. So um, definitely, and you know, because this is, um, this is a, a volunteer, coalition you know we all have um, jobs so definitely on our spare time we do as much as we can with this um, and also like I mentioned creating the youth stalker state um, so those photographs I showed you um, uh, we're currently working with um, a, one college student and one high school student um, so would love some support on that in developing and hashing out that youth stalker state and also um, doing um, so just some basic graphic design. We have some artwork that we would like to turn into some graphics and, um, and also some videos, which um, Glenda, our youth organizer, has already started storyboarding. So just needing some support on video creation. Um, and then of course, just doing your own outreach um, to students and teachers and families. Um, so I just wanted to stop and see if anybody wants, if there's any of these points that you would like to uh, help and support on and collaborate on. Um, you can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. Um, 
yes, thanks, Akhil. Yeah, if, if you can put it in the chat uh, in your email or you can unmute and, and share too. Nadia, was there also uh, a need for the public records piece as well? Um, yes, that's one piece we've been we have been working on. Um, and yes, that's definitely and in, um, inviting folks uh, to support with the Public Records Act um, as well with that process, which we've been uh, working with different students. But of course, it's it's a it's a lengthy process and a detailed process. And then, of course, once we get information back, we'll need help going through it. So. So the PRAs as well. Okay, cool. Thanks, Sydney. That would be great. Um, I think I saved your email. Let me see. Um, yes, I did. Cool. All right, Jennifer. Um, great. That would be nice. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I'll save. It's not letting me copy the email right now. Akil, are you? Can you save that email for some reason? It's not letting me copy. Yeah, it's screen screen grabs of each one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a, a bunch of documents that I downloaded from other people's records requests about CVE, um, which were freely available and it would be really interesting and like for me fun <laughs> to go through that. Yeah, Akil has been really um, like, at least for the war on youth piece has been leading the PRA fight. So, so yeah, props on that. <laughs> just um, writing down other people's ideas, but. <laughs> um, yeah, anybody else? I don't know if, is anybody on here um, interested in maybe helping or or know of, or know some youth who would like to be a part of the Youth Stalker State? Because that one, we for sure have some youth working on that. So we can put, um, we can put them in touch with them. Oh, nice. Thank you, Andrew. That's great. Um, okay, cool, Sydney. You know, that's uh, that's good to know. Um, yeah, and we can definitely um, be in touch then about that. Reach out to your darling daughter, nice Angela. <laughs> Thank you. That's dope. Oops, sorry. I think I muted myself. Um, I don't know if if you heard, but yes, I saw yours too, Angela, about reaching out to your daughter. Um, okay, cool. So um, yeah, any any other components? You muted yourself again. I myself again, I'm so sorry. Jeez, I'm like, <laughs> sorry, y'all. Um, yeah, I just, is there any other pieces or components that, um, that folks would, um, that folks are interested in? And that can include like working on strategy too, around like see, targeting the CVE programs in schools and in universities. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and just wanted to also share that we're um, also working on like a joint statement around how our framing of CVE and like where it's moving and historicizing it um, as well as part of our strategy and as part of our like popular education tools in trying to make information accessible mm -hmm. to our communities. Okay, great. I put my, I, uh, I saw, and I'm so sorry, I, I forgot your name, but I saw, I put the email response to you. Um, yes, yeah. sorry, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Uh, it's Moral. Moral, okay, nice, Moral, thank you. Um, and my email's in there, so if anybody else, uh, you're, all, you're welcome to email me too. The other piece I just uh, also want to just flag is that the the data driven policing group is also doing a deep dive into all the algorithms and and laser zones and all of that, which kind of looking at the the evictions and the injunctions on the the homes and everything else. So how that will impact youth, and I think another particular one piece around the community safety partnerships, which is this community policing arm 
that they're using going into housing projects <clears throat> and how you know this whole idea of cops then uh, partnering with young people and you know the, the, the same old stuff about escorting them to schools so almost creating this clear division between like you know okay in neighborhoods themselves that who the youth should be fearful of and you know so there may be some sort of possible gang members but these youth have to watch out for those so that's a whole lot of that is also happening in the community safety partnership piece as well in Jordan Downs and Nickerson Gardens and other housing projects. Nice. Um, well, well, thank you. I definitely um, will definitely be following up with folks. Um, Meryl, I'll look for your email as well. And uh, would be great to just follow up in general with you all at Project South, um, maybe have a conversation um, as well. So, um, so I'll be looking out for that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything else to share or Hamid, if you have any um, general, I know we had, we had reserved some of the time to, you know, for the ENCODE Justice, uh, which is another group that we're, uh, we recently connected with and we're gonna be building with, um, but as Akil said, they weren't able to make it. Um, so yeah, so if I don't know if how many of you have any announcements or anything else to share for yeah, next Yeah, just week. Two, two quick announcements uh, where next Tuesday's webinar are two key uh, presentations. One is uh, that uh, the breaking down of uh, the surveillance uh, uh, apparatus within Department of Children and Family Services, that particularly with Child Protective Services and, and DCFS, these are county is one of the largest county program serving families and, and children, uh, how the information sharing environment is, is uh, uh, used in there, who all has access to the information. Um, so uh, we had, a, we had a, a fellow, a student from um, um, UCLA, Ramsha Sajid, and she's gonna be, she did a sort of a, uh, an overview and, and is, we're gonna be releasing a brief uh, on that too, with a short report on DCFS. And I think it's really critical in this conversation around defunding and reinvestments that how people should be fully aware that how deep this carceral state is. Um, so it's not that if law enforcement uh, stops provi providing certain uh, things, uh, a role, that these would be a safer place for our youth either. So, so that's gonna be happening. And then um, the second part of next week is also we are looking to, uh, because the coalition is in partnership with Free Radicals is doing a deep dive into the budget piece, but also looking at the, uh, uh, the, the technology budget and other things too. But I think this has also created an opportunity uh, for us to long-term seed a conversation around this whole conversation around defunding and how defunding, is it having an impact on our conversation about abolition? Does it take away the oomph about abolition? Does it water down? Is it, does it give uh, the other side uh, a way to co-opt our language about defunding? So sort of like you know, starting these conversations as well. So that's gonna be happening. Both of these will be happening next Tuesday at six o'clock on October 20th. Thank you. And um, just also, does anybody have any announcements or any um, any calls for support that they want to share as well? Well, just one quick announcement uh, I can make, and uh, I know Akhil uh, just uh, uh, messaged too about Prop 25, and this is for folks who live in um, LA uh, uh, specifically, uh, and this is a statewide bill as well, which would overturn uh, Senate Bill 10. So we absolutely reject Prop Proposition 25 um, because it, it's being, although it's being the, the argument is that it's gonna give the bail industry a, a lot of power. But the problem is that Prop 25 is, is absolutely about using these very dangerous risk assessment tools, um, which we know that risk assessments have always been used to, to, to criminalize, to contain um, and expand the incarceration of black and brown folks. Uh, so, so in a sense, uh, the, the argument on the other side is, well, then you're supporting the sheriffs and also the bail industry. Well, that's not the argument. For us, it's really critical 
that it's not like, you know, that we're going to get stuck in this binary, that either it's this or that. No. I mean, if risk assessments are absolutely a, a lightning rod for, for, for more incarceration, and we've seen how through chronic offender programs and other things, so then we've seen the whole history of algorithms and being very familiar about algorithms as well, the harm that the algorithms do. So we absolutely reject um, uh, the, the, the measure. And we have, so, you know, when people are asking us, we're like, no, we, we should vote no on Proposition 29. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ali. I don't know if other people have comments on that. Cool. That was all, that was for me, the, the announcements, all of them. Cool. Anybody else have an announcement to share? <clears throat> all right, well, um, well, thank you all for, for joining and um, just, um, you know, and also for folks for sharing their emails. Definitely we'll be following up very soon. Um, to, to collaborate, whether it's across the country, uh, here in LA. So definitely looking forward to that. And again, my email, I did put it in the chat. So feel free to, to reach out um, there and uh, we'll see you all then uh, next, uh, next Tuesday for the general meeting. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody.